Hello and welcome to Biblical Genetics episode five. I'm your host, Dr. C, coming at you today from the Mid-America Windmill Museum in Kendallville, Indiana. This is such a cool place. There's all these great examples of technology. Human brains trying to figure out how to grab this the free stuff called wind and harness that power and do something with it, to pump, to saw, to do all these amazing things that we've done over, over many centuries. But you know, even our best technology, even the coolest thing that we've ever done is nothing compared to the technology we see inside the cell. In fact, the technology of the cell is more complicated than anything humankind has ever been able to reproduce. So now we're sitting here with a, with a problem. We're trying to explain how things like the human genome work, but we don't understand it because we're not smart enough yet. So let me give you an analogy. Imagine that the human genome is like a computer, like a computer operating system. Well, as soon as we start doing this, we're gonna realize that we don't have any computers that compare. Because unlike our computers, uh, computer programmers, they write in lines of code. Remember back in high school math, you remember a line is a one-dimensional object, is really long, has no width to it at all? Well, computer programmers write in lines of code, so their code is really one-dimensional. But on the other hand, it's two-dimensional because this piece of code connects to this piece of code and this piece controls this piece and this calculates something and sends this number over to here. And so you get this, this uh, two-dimensional network of interaction. So that's as complicated as it gets. The genome, though, I like to say, is four-dimensional. Now, the rest of this talk is going to be a very brief summary of my favorite lecture I've ever given in my entire life. I, we filmed this at a creation super conference that CMI put together several years ago. It's called the High Tech Cell. Follow the links in the show notes. You can find it. It's, it's um, available on creation.com if you're interested. Unlike a computer, the human genome operates in four dimensions. It's extremely complicated and crazy technology-wise. Here's how it works. We have a string. We have DNA. It's a line. It's six feet long. That six feet is packed into something you can't even see inside the nucleus of your cell. If you were just to read the letters, A, T, G, C, C, A, C, C, G, C, C, A, 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 C, G, C, it's really, really boring. And yet, those letters together make an incredible system that makes you, and you are not boring. But just like a computer, where this piece of code over here controls this piece of code over here, and this one calculates something and feeds it back over here, your cell does that also. You have this ginormous, unbelievably complex interrelationship web of all these pieces of DNA where this gene makes a product that comes over here and influences this gene or turns on this system or changes this chemical to that chemical. It's this giant 2D network, okay? But there's four dimensions. The third dimension of the DNA, of your genome, is the shape. DNA has a shape. Now, I'll put a lot of this information in the show notes, but I remember right after uh, the human genome was sequenced, one of the first things someone did is they said, well, we have these genes that are used together in this biochemical pathway. Let's go look and see where they are in the genome because, you know, I might expect them to be found together in the genome. Just like in, um, in bacteria, there's a famous thing in E. coli called the lac operon. It's a set of three genes and they're used to digest lactose. Well, just upstream of that, there's a little control signal that turns on the set of genes or turns off the set of genes, allowing them to digest lactose or not. Okay. Well, they're right next to each other, and they're in a line. Whoosh, easy. Turn it on. All three things are used. It's not like that way in the, hum in the human genome at all. In fact, the genes are random. They're found all over the place, different chromosomes, different, different directions. And so the studiers who were looking at this, they said, oh, it's just junk. The human genome is just millions of years of evolutionary experiments, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just junk. Well, later on, another group stepped up and they said, wait a second. If we treat the cell with formaldehyde, any DNA next to each other is going to crosslink. And once you crosslink the DNA like that, even if the pieces aren't next to each other in the same chromosome, we can cut it up, we take all these, these DNA X's, and we can sequence the arms of those X's. And when we did that, we realized that all these genes that are on different chromosomes are actually held together in 3D space right next to each other. Oh, 
and the genes that are used together are next to each other in 3D. So whoever programmed that first linear string knew how it was going to fold up into this giant 3D blob so that the genes that are needed are, are used right there. And the coolest thing, I mean, it, it's, it gets even more complicated from there because not only are they together, but they tend to form a pocket, an open spot. So all the genes are in this hollow place near a nuclear pore. So they can all be turned on together. The messenger RNAs can go out the nuclear pore and get translated into proteins. And now we've learned some more added stuff after the fact. The things that translate DNA or RNA into protein are called ribosomes. But they're different ribosomes for different sets of genes. So when we looked at the genes, there, um, there's three letters that code for each amino acid, which means a lot of amino acids have more than one code. Well, some genes use one code more than others. It was a big mystery. Well, now we realize that there are ribosome sets that are fine-tuned to work with one group of genes and other ribosomes that are coded to work with other groups of genes in another level of complexity. Oh, boy. Okay, so that's three levels. The fourth level is literally time. The genome changes shape over time. Yeah, do that with a computer program. Oh yes, it changes shape. As different genes are needed, the ones that aren't used are kind of buried and packed away in just in this densely coiled DNA. But when you need them, the cell has to open up the DNA, change the shape of the chromosomes, expose a gene, use it, and when it's done, it packs it away again. So there's 3D conformational changes, but it's more than that because the 2D interaction network also changes. And it's more than that. The first dimension of the DNA, that linear string, can literally be recoded on the fly. We don't tend to do that with our computer programs. I mean, we've always been experimenting with dynamically reprogramming programs, but it's really complicated and a lot of unexpected things keep happening. But the genome does it routinely. In fact, there's one point in, um, in development where your brain is producing millions of neurons a minute. And those neurons are produced in specific areas of the brain, and then they travel through the brain to get to where they're supposed to go. Well, how do they know what to do? Why is one neuron different from another? Well, it turns out there's these little things called jumping genes, or retrotransposons that they used to say all retrotransposons are remnants of ancient viral infections. They're just junk DNA. They're just sitting there. They're parasitic. Well, actually, no. The, the brain cells have actually different genomes. The retrotransposons will pop out, go somewhere else, and stick themselves somewhere else in the genome of the brain cell. And that changes the code. And that changes the type of brain cell. And now this, we have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 because of these little retrotransposons. They discovered that in the mouse embryo, if you deactivate one class of these things, the mouse embryo will develop and then stop. Because a lot of retrotransposons carry the start sequence for different genes. And so then by them popping around and moving in, in the genome, they change the first dimension of the genome, which affects everything else downstream. In fact, in the liver cell, uh, you have different chromosome counts. Your livers have to, they have to de detoxify a lot of things. So they need lots of gene products. So in one way to do that, they just copy extra chromosomes. So if this liver cell needs a lot of copies of, of this particular gene, it'll just dink, 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 add more chromosomes. So we have different gene count, different genomes in each liver cell. In fact, there's another retrotransposon, going back a second, that is intrinsic to the binding of the placenta to the uterine wall. It's used in all mammals. In fact, without that so-called junk DNA, we would have no mammals. So that's incredibly functional, very important stuff. Junk DNA is passe. We're going to do lots of talking about that in the future. But that is just a brief introduction into the four dimensions of the genome. We'll be getting back to uh, genetic technology, cellular technology a lot, but that's just the start. Now, if you're liking uh, this sort of stuff, please follow us share our videos, subscribe to our channel, uh, watch our, or listen to our podcasts. We really need your support. We really want to promote the show. I really appreciate all of you spending your time with me. This is Dr. C for now, signing off. Have a great day.